This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 218, recorded on February 1st, 2013. Hello everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How's the weather today? It's um, kind of transitional. It snowed a little this morning, and then now it, then it was clear, and then it clouded over, and we had a whole bunch of wind yesterday, but it's, it's partly sunny, I guess, or partly cloudy, depending on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. <laughs> I went to Washington uh, yesterday, uh, Wednesday night. I got there. It was pouring. It was 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the next day it was freezing. Yeah. It dropped like 40. And today here, it's minus one Celsius. Yeah, it, it, it was gorgeous and warm. Actually, not gorgeous and warm. It was humid and warm. and yeah, then it's it, weird. Huh? And it plummeted, and now it's, yeah. Also joining us today, also from the state of Massachusetts, from Boston, Welkin Johnson. Hey, welcome Hello. back. <laughs> hey, you remembered my name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I have these moments. I'm telling you, it's pretty scary. It's not just you. How have you been? I'm good. I'm good. I've been at Boston College now for just over a year. I think when we, so, the last time you were on TWIV, you were still at the Primate Center, right? That might be, or I might have just come over here. I was probably sitting in an empty lab. That might be. The last time. So everything is good? You're, you're, you're having a good time over there? Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> and the, the lab is running? Yeah, the lab is full and running. That, that part's going pretty well, and I'm still getting used to all the teaching. You have a lot of teaching? So I'm doing my viruses, genes, and evolution course for the second time. Uh-huh. And I hated all my lectures the first time, so I'm redoing everything again. <laughs> That's <good. laughs> I should just show your lectures on, on the iPad or something. Well, we, <laughs> yours is a, it sounds like a different course, you know. Yeah. The first half of it has to be basic virology to get everybody up to speed. But then, mm-hmm. So you don't record your lectures, right? I do, actually. I, I took your advice and I got screen flow. Yeah. So I capture the audio and the slides and post them on the Blackboard site for the class. So it's just for BC, right? Yeah. Too yeah. bad, because I would love to watch those. Maybe you could send me some of the later ones on evolution. Yeah. Uh, I would like I, to just, l- just learn, you know. <laughs> you know, part of the trick is I have to get to the point where all the f- illustrations belong to me. Yeah, I know. When I'm not using copyrighted. <laughs> I tell you, this is this is an interesting point. Let me let me tell you, at the risk of diverging, but I think people won't mind hearing this. So, as everyone knows, I've been putting my virology lectures uh, on iTunes for quite a while, and this year. Columbia signed a deal with Coursera, this massively online course, MOOC, M-O-O-C, massively online, oh, man, <laughs> we, got, we did this before, I can't remember. Yeah, massively thing. online something college or... Whatever. Anyway, I, so I don't know if there's any money involved, I just don't know, but... Massive open online course. Okay. There you go. I have to sign this legal document, okay, to do this with the university, which, of course, I didn't have to do to put my lectures on iTunes. And um, one of the things, it says you have to get permission to use all the materials that are in your lectures. Oh, oh man. I mean, most of it is from my book, right? A lot of it's from all over the web. I have no idea where from. I tend to stick on <laughs> Wikipedia so that it's open source at least. But Yeah, yeah. So the, my book, so I... I I emailed the publisher, and they said, oh, you, you might have to pay us for that. I'm going, oh, my gosh. This is yeah. just ridiculous. Mm. Nobody's making money. Right. So I hope yeah. to work it out. Otherwise, it's not going on Coursera this year. That's too bad. I mean, I understand the publishers have to you know, protect them. But on the other hand, if no one's making money, isn't it a great publicity for them? You'd think yeah. so. Yeah. Are you still allowed to leave them on iTunes? Well, they're there. Nobody's objected. Like if the university That's not has quite a, the you, same. Yeah, well, I'm telling you the <laughs> truth because I just put them up one day uh, and the university helped me and they never said sign an agreement that you have the rights to this. This is um, 
some of this is settled law, but a lot of it is um, is kind of up in the air, uh, especially with something like academic lectures. Mm-hmm. And this is this is something where um, you would you would show these slides in a classroom, and that's fair use. Right now, you're using these slides in a lecture that you're putting online. Is that fair use? I don't know. I mean, I'm not monetizing it, right? Right. You're not, and not only are you not monetizing it, but you're providing the bulk of the content and the presentation. Right. It's not like you're selling these figures um, to be used just as figures. You're using them to illustrate a lecture, and the lecture is what people are there to experience. So it's. Um, it, yeah, th- these sorts of things get into very murky territory. I, I completely understand why Columbia wants to make sure it's it's dotted all its eyes, but yeah. what a pain. Well, at the, at the worst, I have to redo all the figures myself, but right. boy, I, I really don't... I mean, we're talking about 26 lectures with, I'd say, an average of 50 slides per lecture, and maybe half of them at least would be from the book. It's a right. lot. So uh, it's very scary to me, but uh, <laughs> just to let everyone know, this is weird stuff. I just want you know everyone to learn virology. I know the publisher needs to get paid, but nobody's making money f- from these, so it's a good ad for you, your book, right? I'm sure people have bought the book based on it. Sure. You know? Anyway, so there you go, Welkin. Hmm. <laughs> does, does BC uh, do iTunes University? I, I, I haven't looked yet. I don't know. Yeah. I know that the bigger lectures get automatically get captured yeah. on video in the big lecture hall, but I don't know what happens to them. All right, let's move on. Uh, we have some follow-up, but before we do that, some sad news. Uh, Quan Te Jiang. Did I say that right, Welkin? I think so. That's how I say it. Quan, everyone <laughs> calls him right. T. Everyone calls him T. Yeah. As a retrovirologist at NIH, died on Sunday. No one knows why he died. He was 54. He's the guy who founded this journal, Retrovirology. You've probably published in there, right, Welkin? I, I haven't, but we're all aware of it because it was so central in the whole XMRV That's right. saga. <laughs> and it's open yeah. access, right? So. And it's open access, which is a nice... So a year ago, last, uh, let's see, June... Over a year, June 2011, I sat next to T on a study section, and he said, love that twiv. If you'd like, I can come on sometime. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> and I said, sure. I'd love to, because he, he said, I want to talk about open access more. And, uh, you know, I never got around to it. And this is always what happens. Not always, but it happens. No, this it happens. <laughs> it's happened we don't now. lose all of our guests before they come on. Uh, this is, no, uh, I've, there have been other people who yes. I've wanted to get on, and they've died. Yeah. I wanted to get Renato Dulbeco. That would have been cool. I wanted to get Aaron Shatkin. So I, I, the moral is you just have to do it when you first get the idea. Anyway, it's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. And uh, so 54 is pretty young. Yeah. And so on the way to driving in this morning, I decided I have to tell all the TWIV team how to access the, <laughs> the files so in case I disappear, the TWIV can go on. Because I think it's, it's important that it continue, right, and not be halted by any of us leaving. It's a little right, morbid, yeah. I know, but I, I think it is now at the point where TWIV is a thing that should go on ir- irrespective of anyone, so... I agree, but I want you to stick around. I yeah. love to, yeah, as long good. as I can. Yeah. I really I have a good time, so this is a good team, and we have a lot of fun, so I plan to. I had the idea, I had the thought as I was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike, and, you know, full of semis next, left and right, who knows when these guys are just going to cut over, right? Yeah. <laughs> or jackknife. It's pretty scary. I try to stay away from them, but. All right, we have some follow-up. We have a lot of follow-up on the flu vaccine episode. This is good. I guess people liked it, right, Alan? I guess so. So Nick Kelly, who's at the, who's at SIDRAP, who helped me a lot, he writes, just finished listening to TWIV on the way to work. You guys did a great job on the episode. Here's a good article on the adjuvant narcolepsy issue. So he sends a link to an article about that. There's some great genetic factors that are being looked at, which is really important in this homogeneous population. 
just in case you're interested, there were some critiques recently of the CDC study methods for estimating vaccine effectiveness. The authors responded and got into the epidemiology of what they did and why. So he provides a link to a post about that, which is really nice. So check those out. We'll put those in the show notes. Diane wrote to thank us for the amazing episode on flu vaccines. You answered all my questions and more, and it really helped. So that's cool. Clifton wrote, I just listened to TWIV 217. I have a question. Regarding efficacy of the flu vaccine, Alan pointed out that the polio vaccine is given three times, but flu shots are only once. After getting flu in 1990, I have not missed a year since. I know that WHO changes the strains often due to mutating strains, but apparently I have received several years of vaccine for the California 2009 H1N1 pandemic virus. And even when the strains are not good matches, the CDC claims there is some benefit of the vaccine. Has anyone ever checked to see if the efficacy increases for people who get their flu shot every year? If not, would you think there may be an increased benefit from getting vaccinated every year? I know I may be asking you to speculate. For the benefit of your demographics, I have a PhD in systems engineering working for the federal government, not health-related, but I do have an interest in virology since, like you, viruses make me sick. Now, you could interpret that last phrase too. Yes, yes. <laughs> do I viruses make, and you make him sick. Do I make no. him sick? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm so sorry, Cliff. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to that. Do you, uh, Alan, if you get boosts? I, I don't know if anybody has looked at that. I think it would be a great study if you could get robust results on it. Because there have been um, there have been years, for example, um, last year and the year before, the vaccine was identical both of those years. I don't think it's changed since two thousand and nine. Well, no, it changed for this year. The H one N one. No, not the H one N one. I'm talking about the entire makeup of the oh, vaccine, yeah. right? Because uh, that's that's really what you would want to look at is people getting the the whole thing identically as if it were a booster shot separated by one year mm. um, and see if that produced more robust antibodies. Um, and so it seems to me like the experiment has been done. I mean, I got both of those shots, even though I'd gotten the previous one. I got the one again, even knowing that it was the same shot. Um, and I, I think that'd be great to look at. Maybe Nick yep. knows. So, Nick, if you're listening yeah, in your car... Just drop us a note, but drive safely. Uh, but this uh, this fellow is right. He's he's he uh, has gotten the pandemic '09 virus over and okay. over and since '09. Many, yeah, many people have. So Amanda writes, "I d- dearest dearest Twivonians." That's good. I, no, no. We never got a dearest. I'm a recent convert to the Twix universe, and I have to say, I love your podcast. They make my walk to and from the lab a treat. And turn me on to research I might otherwise have missed. I'm currently a postdoc at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Currently, I'm working on influenza and strep pneumo. I previously completed my PhD at the University of Saskatchewan. I know. Saskatchewan? Oh, not Saskatchewan, huh? Pronounce Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. She gave us a phonetic pronunciation thank you in vaccine development i have to say whenever you mention the weather being cold i snicker a little thinking about growing up in northern saskatchewan with minus 35 to 40 degrees celsius winters with minus 40 to 48 degree wind chills note at minus 40 celsius and fahrenheit are equal so these numbers should mean about the same to you as they do to me hmm. Today in Halifax, it's a balmy minus 10 Celsius with a minus 19 wind chill. Almost T-shirt weather. So I guess Halifax froze over. God, yeah. (laughs) Very good. Now to my point. While I lean towards viruses being not alive, I have found a compelling case for scientists to call them alive, regardless of personal preference. I found myself chatting with my seatmate on a plane over Christmas, and the topic turned to vaccines, in particular the influenza vaccine. She mentioned her fear of having virus introduced into her body. I assured her it was an activated virus, and she said, but it's still live virus. 
I explained that inactivated means dead. In this case, the virus cannot re replicate and is only there to induce an immune response so that when your body next encounters that strain of influenza, it will react quickly since it remembers the strain. This conversation concerned me, so I began asking non-scientist friends and family what they thought the influenza vaccine was made up of and what they thought the term inactivated means. The vast majority of those I talked to did not realize that inactivated means essentially dead in this case, and some even thought the term inactivated was a bit suspicious and vague. So, while us microbiologist types can sit and argue about viruses being alive or not, for the sake of the general public and their fear of vaccines, it might be better for us to use the term alive for infectious virus and dead for non-infectious. Ah... Uh, I think that's. I think this sounds like a poll. Yeah. yeah. Do you think a, a lot a, an activated virus is alive or dead? I guess. Or should be called alive or dead? Yeah. What do you think about that? Not a bad point, right? Whatever works. Whatever gets people immunized, right? Yeah. 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 I think it's. I think it's a really good point. When I'm talking with the general public about vaccines, and you know, picking up my kid from dance class or something and people are talking about the flu vaccine i when this comes up i say i would say it's a killed vaccine the virus is dead yeah I, it's I, it's, it's much killed. simpler for people to grasp that concept yeah i agree that you confuse them with too much information if you start saying you know it's not really dead because it's never alive right that's not and it's point. it's not a lie to say that it's a dead it's a killed vaccine i mean that's that term is even used in the industry I, well, as you know, I don't like it. I know. Um, <laughs> the virion is never alive. Right. The infected cell is is alive for sure. Do you you know this? I don't know if we've talked about this, but I'm sure we have. There's this view now as the, as virus as an organism with two phases: a virion and an infected cell. Right. Yeah. This, this is from the guys who work on Mimi viruses. You know, I sort of like that. <laughs> I, yeah, I do too. If you've ever watched a an infected cell forming a synapse with another cell. It's like, it's so alive. Yeah, for sure. Right. But, but you've also hit on the answer. The answer is to not refer to virus. The vaccine is virion, right? Yeah, that's right. So maybe, maybe avoid the word virus entirely. Call it inactivated virion or... Eh, people get confused. Completely, utterly dead virion. Amanda's right. You're going to just confuse them. <laughs> yeah, and people refer to their car dying or their computer dying. And ah, these things aren't that's alive a good either. point. Hey, does anyone think their car is alive? I bet some people do. Uh, probably, but that's not really the point. It's, <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, that's kill, a good point. It's just killed a, or dead a, means it's it's inactivated. Figure of speech, right? Yeah. Yeah. My my computer just died. Yeah. Right. I'm dying here. Well, yeah. you you could <laughs> die because you're alive. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean that. I want you to, but. Yeah, I'm getting yeah, in trouble. Yeah. Next, uh, what next one is from Jonas, who writes, "Dear fellow scientists, regarding your discussion on narcolepsy and the 2009 influenza, a report from 2011 showed a similar increase in narcolepsy in China during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. This, despite only very few of the newly diagnosed patients being vaccinated against flu." And he provides a reference for that. A recent report from South Korea, where they use MF. 59 and not ASO3 as an adjuvant, showed a decrease in newly reported cases of narcolepsy after the influenza vaccine campaign commenced. It's the opposite, huh? Different adjuvant. A decrease in narcolepsy. It's weird. So there could be other causes of increased narcolepsy besides ASO3, and as always, more studies are needed. Yes. Yes. For sure. An unrelated but for me funny coincidence with my first comment to TWIV I was born in Linkoping, which is not the right way to say it, right? Condit had it last time. Linkoping? Uh, no, it's even different. I can't remember. Sweden, and lived there for 18 years before moving to Scott Stockholm regarding Dr. De Palmier's planned travel to Linkoping. That's cool. As regards, Jonas is uh, in the Department of Infectious Diseases in Sweden, Gothenburg. All right, one more. Jeff writes, first let me say I enjoy the podcast. It makes the San Francisco Bay Area commute entertaining, educational, and less stressful. I did want to point out one correction on TWIB 217. You can actually challenge people with influenza in the context of a clinical trial at a company in the UK called RetroScreen. 
They also do challenges with RSV and rhinovirus. I have seen Dr. Rob Lamkin Williams present at a conference on the conduct of these studies and think an interview with him would be of interest to the TWIV audience. So this is right. There's this company that does all kinds of challenges. And if they do flu and respiratory syncytial rhinovirus, if you want to be involved in the flu, they have this website called flucamp.com. And if you're 18 to 45 years old, you can enroll. It lasts 10 to 18 days, and they will pay you up to 3,750 pounds sterling. Wow. It's wow. a lot of money, right? Well, you're going to be given the flu. Yeah, they're challenging you. What kind of insurance policy do they have to have? A big one. I'm yeah. just I'm just amazed. <laughs> Notice 18 to 45 years old, right? Yeah, they're not going to have the elderly or kids in this <laughs> type of study. I'm just amazed. I'm totally amazed that they do this. I wonder what strain they use. It must be. No, they don't tell. I looked. There's nothing published. But apparently they're doing a, tra- a flu transmission trial with CDC. They're gearing up to do that. Wow. So if you need some money and you don't mind the possibility that you might die. <laughs> right? But there's again. always that possibility, isn't there? Gotta... Well, could, you this could die of flu. This is going to be a topic of the... You could die of flu. It's, you, it's your fault, Walton. You came on and made us morbid. <laughs> isn't it possible to die from influenza? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be scared to death unless it's a totally... Maybe they just challenge you with vaccine strains. I don't know. That could be a flu mist strain, right? I have a <clears throat> flu vaccine question. Can you, I ask a question? You, yeah, you could do follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, so I took my daughter, Casey, and I went... She's 10, and we went to the high school to get our free flu vaccines a couple months ago. And they offered the mist or the shot and i wanted to convince her to try the shot just as you know to get over her fear of shots of needles or whatever (laughs) and i went first so that i could prove to her that it wasn't a big deal um and so she's standing there and the nurse is giving me the vaccine and the barrel of the syringe popped in half while she was doing it while it was in my arm (laughs) yeah so that didn't help much and they um some of the vaccine actually went on casey's face my gosh. Like got in her eyes and stuff. And I was wondering if she got an extra boost because of that. It's not a normal route of administration. No. <laughs> did it burn it's, her It's not a way to convince kids that getting no. a vaccine is okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, did she, how old is she? She's 10. Did she start crying or anything? No, no, no. She laughed? Actually, and she, she went ahead and got, yeah. She well, had, afterwards, we were making fun of the whole process. That's really uh, weird that that happened. Yeah. But, so she got the injected? She did, yeah, and it, and she handled it just fine. But I think the uh, flu mist is probably better. That that might be. She's had that in past years. I think the pediatrician usually offers that. Yeah, because the best data for protection are there in that age group, right? Eighty three percent. Yeah, I um, my daughter loves the the flu mist, but in previous years, uh, a few years ago, she got um, the shot. So you know that's that's perfectly legitimate way to do it too but the whether the whether the inoculum into the eye would have any effect i would i would kind of think not i mean i'm just, i'm not basing that on anything except just intuitively you've got an uh, a killed uh, sorry inactivated <laughs> virus um and going into mucosa of the eye i i don't she now know, has a very localized protection against. She, flu. Yeah, she's she's immune from flu of the right eye or whichever <laughs> eye she got it in. You know, it is it unreasonable that you could get infected through a mucosal, you know, conjunctival membrane like that? They probably could. Aren't they connected to your sinuses? Right, which are connected to your nose, right? Yeah. So it could be a virus could make its way to your respiratory tract from the eye. Yeah, but an inactivated vaccine, of course, isn't going to do much. Yeah. I guess they also have to wonder whether I got vaccinated. Yeah. Oh, you they didn't don't... give you another shot. No, the, oh. the volunteer wasn't sure what to do, so I just let it go. <laughs> okay. I don't know how much. Or she seems to think I got some of it, but 
obviously I didn't because some of it went on Casey. Oh, man. <laughs> it sounds bad. I wonder how often those things happen, right? You should, r- you should write CDC and tell them. It's an adverse effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about papers. I, I, I found a while ago two cool papers on endogenous retroviruses in mice, and I thought of you right away. Welcome. Was that the proper thing to do? <laughs> Hence why you thought of me. Yeah, you're an Irv. You, you, uh, you're an, you're a nervous wreck. <laughs> yeah. That was the one of that was your first podcast title. Yeah. Uh, I'm a nervous wreck. Um <clears throat> and they both have to do with endogenous uh, retroviruses in mice. So these are two heavily immunological papers, and I think we need to just sort of summarize the <laughs> results in broad ways, but there's a lot of cool things to talk about here. Did you, did you want to uh, prime us on on herbs before we start? Yeah, I think um, if I can avoid the immunology for a few minutes, it might be easier to start <laughs> by just explaining the, okay. <laughs> the viruses behind the scene. Um, um, so the, there are two papers. One is, I guess, was in Nature and the other one in Immunity. And right. in both cases, they're, um, they're working with mice uh, infected with murine leukemia viruses. So murine means mouse. <clears throat> so it's easier to just think of it as mouse leukemia virus, I guess, if that's easier. And so the uh, MLV or murine leukemia viruses are gamma retro, they're retroviruses, they're gamma retroviruses. And they are long standing models for understanding cancer. So these, uh, for decades now, uh, people have been working on MLV in mice as models for tumorigenesis and cancer in tissues. Um, um, and the important thing here is that, they're, that it's because they induce the tumors, right? So there aren't MLVs that we know of. There aren't gamma retroviruses that we know of that cause cancer in humans. So the importance of the model was that the mice get cancer and then you can study how cancer works. Um, what's interesting about mice is in addition to these exogenous murine leukemia virus that can spread from mouse to mouse, uh, and cause cancer. Uh, mice also have endogenous MLV, right? Endogenous uh, proviruses, uh, meaning that uh, there are MLV sequences that have invaded the mouse germline, DNA proviruses. So not viruses, but sequences encoding the viruses have been deposited in the germline of the mouse. And so they're sitting there uh, as DNA elements scattered through among all the other mouse genes. And endogenous viral sequences, and we also call them ERVs, right, for endogenous retrovirus, the longer they, they sit there in the genome of a host, uh, the more likely they are to suffer inactivating mutations. Just they'll slowly degrade over time. Um, that's especially true if they're of no benefit to the host or if they're deleterious to the host, then, then they'll, the, they'll get DNA mutations that sort of shut them down so they can, can no longer express uh, virus or virus proteins. Right, so mm-hmm. we've right. talked about this on previous shows. Yeah. Right, All, every yeah. every organism has genomes full of these things. What's interesting about the MLVs in mice is that there are actually um, relatively recent insertions on an evolutionary time scale. So there are endogenous MLVs in mice that have intact or mostly intact viral genes. Right, intact in the sense that um, it would really not require much to patch them up. There might be a mutation or two that if you could correct them, then you would have uh, an infectious replication competent uh, virus again. But there are uh, also some that are in making replication competent viruses, or no? Yeah. There so are. for the most part, they're inactivated, but they're, they're not that far away. They haven't been around long enough to be completely degraded. And, and what that means is that they could, under the right circumstances, uh, give rise to infectious particles again. Mm-hmm. The way... Uh, the way that can happen, and, and that's what comes up in this paper, is that you could get complementation and recombination of viral genomes, right? So if a mouse genome, say, has two of these endogenous retroviruses mm. in the same genome, and ERV1 is defective in virus gene X, and ERV2 is defective in virus gene Y, then if by chance, if you express both of those in the same cell, the two defective genomes can complement one another. So they can make a rescued recombinant virus that is, has both functioning X and Y genes, and now you have a recombinant that, that has everything it needs to, and it can start spreading and replicating like an infectious virus again. And so people this have happen. tested some aspects of this experimentally, right? 
Yeah, actually, the phenomenon's been documented yeah. many times over the decades. So it's a very low probability event, but we know about it because when it happens, the signal, right, is drastic pathogenesis, right? Mm -hmm. It's so even even if it happens in a one in a a billion cells or something, when it happens, the virus spreads and a mouse gets sick in the lab, so then you know about it. So our endogenous retroviruses are all trashed, right? We don't make any particles, right? Uh, um, and so ours have been in us longer than the ones have been in mice. Is that the conclusion from that? Yeah, so f people who have looked at the human genomes, there are, there are, um, there are ones that... There's nothing like the MLVs that look like they're ready to go and could be infectious. There are defective ones that can make subsets of viral proteins. So there's some mm -hmm. cell lines that will spontaneously make make um, like capsid structures and things like that. Right. Uh, right. But so far, there's never been a case that I'm aware of where somebody's seen a reactivated human nerve. Okay. This one uh, one paper. Um, I think we should start with this immunity paper by you et al. By um, me. Sorry? By me and Al? No, you. He's <laughs> <laughs> <is> a joke. <laughs> yes. Um, they will use C57 black six mice, common laboratory strain, and they say it has a defective uh, endogenous uh, retrovirus called EMV2, and it has only a point mutation in the polymerase gene that keeps it from being infectious. So close. That's amazing. Yeah. So so I don't I'm surprised it doesn't spontaneously just so mutate, that, right? Yeah. So that I forget which paper talks about I think in the nature paper they actually point out that the provirus there's really two barriers, right? There's the mutation in Paul. Right. But it also would be a um predicted to be blocked by the mouse F V one. Oh right. So this virus, if it were produced, it couldn't infect that mouse because there's a receptor problem or right. there's an entry block, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in essence, it has two defects that would have to be fixed before right. it could spread. So in the U paper, they take C57 black and they cross. They want to know the role of innate immunity in keeping these uh, retroviruses down, I suppose. And so they cross. Uh, they basically make a, a C57 black six strain that has deletions of genes for toll-like receptor 3, 7, and 9. So these are nucleic acid-sensing toll-like receptors. And when they're young, they find these mice are okay. So, But then at like 6 to 10 months, they get more abund. <laughs> they get sick. And they make a ton of, of viruses. They see viral RNA, endogenous viral RNA, and they see particles. So, um, and that is, that eventually they show is the, uh, this M MV2 virus coming out, right? Right. Now, the thing is, how welcome is that these mice get sick because the virus is infecting them, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's a subset of the mice, right, develop um, sort of pre-leukemic cells, I think. Yeah, eventually they... The triple knockout mice do get leukemia. They get some kind of, they get T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, right? I suppose they don't rule out other complicating factors. I mean, they are immunodeficient, so there may be other things going on as well. So basically, if you take toe-like receptors out of these mice, then uh, they get, they somehow reactivate this endogenous retrovirus and... Uh, it infects them and they get sick. So it tells you that these TLRs are important for, I guess, surveillance of these endogenous retroviruses, right? Uh, yeah, it depends on the... The two papers don't really agree on that. Yeah, that's right. I think we'll get into that. Um, so TLR7 seems to be the more important one. They do independent knockouts, right? And TLR7 seems to be the one that is keeping um, the virus down. Uh, in order to get tumors, um, you have to have all three knocked out, right? Yes, that's right. Right. Uh, I'm trying to. I think. I think seven is a sufficient to get the virus activation, but right. all three to get the tumors. Yeah. So there's seven is somehow being involved in surveillance of the virus, but then uh, all three are needed to keep the tumor down. 
and they don't really understand what's going on there, I think, right? Um, it probably has to do with surveillance of some sort, and I don't really, I don't really see that they had a conclusion from that. So this, in the U paper, they say that the viruses that are now circulating in these toll-like receptor null mice have, they say they're probably derived from the EMV2 provirus. Where, and there, there's that mutation in the Paul gene is, is um, changed to the wild type or to a, a form that can allow polymerase expression. Right, so how does that work, Welkin? So, so uh, what's most likely happened here is, is that there was expression of the provirus um, um, in parallel with expression of some other provirus or set of proviruses and what you would have to get is co-packaging of the RNA genomes, one from mm. E2 and one from another provirus in the same virion and have it infect another cell so that you would get recombination, the production of a of the a genome that had repaired the defect. And and I think I I think I'm confusing the papers again, but I think in the nature paper they they actually in their supplemental data they suggest that there had to actually be multiple recombination events yeah. for this to happen. So, so an exceedingly low probability event, um, but prob- right. whatever happened here, right, what, the, what they notice when they knock out the gene in both papers, what they notice is you get a lot more transcription of endogenous viruses. So maybe knocking out the gene the by total, what... It, the total like receptor gene, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Knocking that out has somehow given rise to more expression of viral RNA, which would have the effect of increasing the probability that these unlikely events would happen. I don't understand that, right? Why would transcription increase, right? Yeah, ultimately, why? Well, I don't think they've either papers answered why the transcription increases. Yeah. Um, well, the, these you you not you but you <laughs> says that there's always spontaneous transcription in wild type mice, right? But most of the time it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Or maybe it does give rise to a a virus, but it's it's held down by the innate immune response, right? And it's yeah. only when you take the TLRs away then that virus could replicate and and move on. And it's not clear where the block would be maybe before or after. You might even imagine getting recombination in the production of a an infectious retrovirus, but then it's knocked down by the innate response, right? So that could that could fully be. Yeah, maybe that happens from time to time. Hmm. You know, it also it kind of this isn't come up in either papers, but it raises the issue of if if something's an endogenous virus sequence in a way, if it's expressed at all, why isn't it seen as self? Like right, yeah, that's right, that's right. right. Should yeah. they be colorized to the viral proteins? And absolutely, I wonder, absolutely. It should be. It's there. They're born with it, right? Yeah. Right. Unless it never expressed in the right place at the right time. It right. Could, Maybe yeah. it's not expressed enough in the during the um, immunological education. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, that could be because you have to have the protein around when the yeah during education for to, for tolerization to occur, right? Yeah. But it is an interesting question that this is this is there in the genome and it is being transcribed periodically, spontaneously, and and yet the immune system recognizes it as non-self when it does actually activate. Yeah. So there's a little review article um, in Immunity. It's called "Retroviral Danger from Within." TLR seven is in control. <laughs> now they say at the end, it shows a role for. TLR is an immunosurveillance of endogenous retroviruses. And then they say, who knows, you know, in people, we don't, we don't think we make any, but who knows, maybe we do and our TLRs keep them down. What do you think about that, Welkin? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I think that there, it makes sense there, there would be mechanisms for keeping them from being transcribed. Yeah. Um, what I can't. What I don't get from either paper is why, well, the immunity paper in particular, because they're the ones that propose this is actually a surveillance mechanism. So the part I don't understand is why knocking out the gene then gives rise to expression of the viruses in the first place, right? 
So the, the immunodeficiency in both papers is the lack of an antibody response. Yeah. Right. You, th you think of antibodies as dealing with proteins and antigens, so why would, why would shutting down an antibody response or having a less robust antibody response lead to increased transcription uh, from endogenous genes? Maybe it's just replication of the retrovirus that is not being held in check by the TLR response. Do we it's, know that it's actually transcription? Well, yeah, I, th I think the first part of the papers, the, the original observation is that in, in the mice, um, in the knockout mice, what you see is sort of, I forget if they do microarray. Yeah, they do FE microarray, yeah. Endogenous elements to start with. Um, they say endogenous ERV sequences, yeah, are strongly upregulated. So that cannot be replication? No, that, that would just be RNA made from the proviruses. Hmm. I, I, think, I think where it's important to bring that, I think we need to um, sort of discuss the second paper at the same time. Sure. Because yeah. the, in the Nature paper, one of the things they point out is that it's a time-dependent process, right? That it's not just aged mice that are more likely to have these recombinant viruses, but if they look at colonies of the knockout mice over the generations, it's more and more common to find the reactivated virus in the disease. And, and that says to me that the, the initial event, the expression and recombination is something rare, and that the cancer, the tumorigenesis and the viremia is really, might even be a red herring. It's, it's, that comes later. Um, so I tend to prefer the model that, that, that um, the antibody response is, is a, having an indirect effect. So in the, in the Nature paper, they use rag mice, which are defective in recombination activating gene that allows uh, rearrangement of, of antibodies, right? So they have no T or B cells. Right. And we should call this the young paper to be equivalent. <clears throat> it's the young paper, right? Yes. And and Welkin will think we're talking about him as well. Yes. Because he's young, right? So with rag mice, they found did they use it's the same strain or is, yeah, it's black six, C fifty seven black six. And then if they crossed it onto a rag null, they call T and B cell deficient rag mice, that's what we mean. They get an increase in transcripts of, of uh, these retroviral sequences. So it's the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Only instead of leading to leukemia, which they got in the um, in the U paper, they get leukemia in this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. But um, bum. Yeah. <laughs> it happens, you know. <laughs> All right. I, I need to make a disclosure here too, because if I if I sound like I'm favoring the Nature paper, it's the the second to last author was my outside thesis examiner. John Stoy. Jonathan Stoy, uh -huh. yeah. He's also a good friend. So. That's okay. You That's can, all right. You can do that. Um, all right. So, rag knockout, they make transcripts, and then eventually they, make, they detect virus in them, right? Yeah. And so these, in the absence of B cells um, and T cells... You get these viruses coming up, so it's sort of similar because when you take away TLRs, you eventually you don't get a an antibody response, right? Yeah, what they what the two have in common. So it's the same genetic background, different genes knocked out, but what they had where they overlap is neither of them can make an antibody response. And they find the same virus, EMV two, right? Yeah. Now, and this virus can replicate. In these animals, right? So it's the same as the other so far, right? Yeah, it recombines and then it can replicate. Yeah. Right? So, so you wouldn't even get the viremia unless you're getting expression of multiple proviruses in the first place. Yeah, so they actually show that these were recombinants, right, between endogenous non-ecotropic, which means that those viruses could replicate in the host, right? Uh, say that again. <laughs> They say that these viruses that arise in these rag mice are recombinants between EMV2, right, which is that same ERV as in the other paper with the single point mutation, and endogenous non-ecotropic MLVs. Right. 
So they wouldn't, but the, the result of the recombinant would be something they can replicate in them. Yeah, right. It's taking, um, probably the source sequences also had a different sort of block, and so when you put them together, you get a virus that can replicate in these mice. Now, what you were referring to about the spontaneity of this happening, can you tell us about that? Um, in a colony, right? Yeah. So they say that the generation of this could happen in individual mice, right? De novo. Is yeah. That- yeah. So it it's probably, it's what I was trying to say before, that I think um, it's probably an extremely low-frequency event. Mm-hmm. When you think about what has to happen, and, and and they probably needed multiple recombinations, so you had to get expression probably from two or more proviruses, one of them being EMV2. Um, you had to have two recombination events, so you had to have co-packaging of genomes into a virion somewhere, and rep and recombination, and it had to be the right kind of recombination, right? It couldn't give rise to more defective genomes. It right. had to. Give right. rise. So it, this kind of thing may happen billions of times, but most of them don't amount to anything. Because of our immune response, right? Um, well, because you know, for random reasons, recombination wouldn't always be between yeah, yeah. perfectly complementary sequences. Most of the results you're going to get from, the, from this type of a combination will be defective. Yeah. Right. But it, now and then you'll get a replication component virus, but it'll be taken that, care of right. by the immune system, right? Yeah, so if you've if the line of mice has been around for a hundred or more years and you've had millions of mice and colonies and labs all over the world, uh, you would expect every once in a while that you might get reactivation of the virus and if it replicates and you get cancer, then you if the mouse gets cancer then you'll know about it because the phenotype yeah. even though it's an extremely rare event, the phenotype will be obvious. Okay. Um so again what I think I I think what both papers what is happening in both cases is for some reason the probability of this recombination happening has been increased mm-hmm. by, the, by the specific the, mutations in the in the host right yeah in the one case the TLR and the other the the rag yeah so that's really the cool thing that to figure out next right yeah that's the weird part but how do you exp- if if what they have in common is is the antibodies how how is knocking out the antibody response affecting expression of genes? That's the really interesting thing, right? Even if you didn't get replicating right. virus or cancer out of it, you still have a really difficult thing to explain. Um, although the I, uh, the young et al. paper they they do offer an indirect explanation. Um, th- their suggestion is that the what you lose when they knock out the antibody response, the mouse loses control over its normal intestinal Mm -hmm. the the microbiota in the intestine right gets dysregulated and so they suggest that um, bacterial factors like lps things that normally stimulate innate immunity might get expressed and and in this background they're causing maybe a generalized activation of immune cells or something yeah expression of these sequences um so i don't that's not a definitive answer but to me that model kind of fits, that it's some indirect effect on expression, and then downstream of that, you're getting more of the virus. Yeah, they do some experiments with the gut flora to, to sort yeah. of support that, right? Yeah, they have that observation that if they look at, at the same kinds of mice, the rag knockout mice, but if they were raised um, in sterile environments and don't have the normal intestinal flora uh, bacteria, that they don't have as high an incidence of the spontaneous viremia and the cancer. Right. So it's a, an associate, it's a correlation. It's not direct evidence, but a correlation. Right. Right. And these, these mice with the, that don't have the normal microbiota are, they're kind of abnormal. Yeah. In, in a, a lot of ways as a result of lacking normal digestion. But, right. um, but it's an interesting direction to take this. Actually, that, that alone makes it interesting, right? I mean, when you think about the possibility that your own um, gut flora can affect expression of genes in your cells, that's, yeah. that's a big deal, if that's true. Well, we, there, uh, there's already quite a bit of evidence that the gut flora is influencing quite a bit, right? Yeah. The infectious and non-infectious um, conditions, things like inflammatory 
bowel disease, right? And then even virus susceptibility. Remember we talked about those two papers where susceptibility to polio or I think it was murine mammary tumor virus is uh, regulated by the gut microbiota. Yeah, it's a, it's become um, the, this whole microbiomic field has really blossomed lately. And I'm actually working on a story about uh, the, the techniques people are using in that right now. But it's, uh, it, it's a lot deeper than we imagined. So the, in the case of polio, remember, you need LPS, I believe it was, to get successful polio infection in the gut of mice. I think that's right. And then the MMTV story was you also needed LPS to make sure you didn't get the wrong immune response so that MMTV would be able to persist. Right. The viruses have, have actually adapted to the, the presence of these molecules that are there in the gut microbiota, which makes sense because that's the environment in which they're carrying out the infection. But, that, mm. but that's part of – that's become a, a prerequisite for them to infect now. So in this case – if you take away the gut microbiota, you don't get the induction of these retroviruses, right? Is that right? The, yeah, or you don't get it as nearly as often. Yeah. Because then the idea is that you take away the antibody response, the gut microbiota goes wrong, and then some product of that stimulates the production of herbs, right? So there's a there's a symbiosis of some sort, right? There's a regulation. Everything is is happy. Well, Isn't it really cool? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's there's a lesson here that I don't know if um, the your listeners who aren't practicing scientists sort of maybe aren't aware the degree to which when <clears throat> when papers are published or when you're trying to publish papers the degree to which sometimes the uh, journalists and or editors can sort of influence the way you tell a story because. I don't want to get in trouble for saying, but if you look at these papers and the commentaries and even the articles, like you, uh, there's that Science Magazine article. Mm. What it seems like a lot of people latch on to is the big deal that this virus is coming back to life and causing cancer. But I, I think what we're hitting on here is even if that didn't happen in these studies, the real core of what's interesting here is what's turning on these genes and the possible connection to something like the... the the gut microbiota. Oh, absolutely. Right. The cancer is, is irrelevant. That happens simply because the, the retroviruses are integrating next to an oncogene, right? Yeah, and, and these viruses sort of, they're, they're good at activating oncogenes when they land near them. Yeah, right? we know that. That's nothing new, right? Yeah, the, the cool thing is what you said, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the role of the immune response. And so the first paper did not look at the gut flora, so... The, the cell, the immunity paper didn't get you onto that, right? Um, yeah, no, they so they they suggest the direct mechanism. So their model is that um, it's not the lack of TLR seven is uh, what they suggest is that TLR seven actually is involved in survey surveillance to see if endogenous viruses get reactivated, and that in normal mice uh, TLR seven one um, detect the presence of the endogenous virus when it pops up, right. trigger an antibody response, and the whole thing will get shut down before you even know about it. Right. Which is also possible, but it, it, it doesn't explain why the viruses get turned on in the first place. And so you would think, based on the Nature paper, that getting rid of TLR 3, 7, and 9 is, is really, it could be mucking up the gut flora and then that provides the trigger for um, the ERV activation. Yeah, I, I think so. Again, I'm not an immunologist, but my, what, I, what I got out of the two papers is that what they have in common is that it's the antibody response that's ultimately affected. Yeah. And, and so if that has something to do with the mechanism, it makes more sense to me that you know, bacteria will be seen by antibodies, but I don't, genes should not be. This, the last... Um Sentence of the Nature paper says interactions between microbial symbionts leading to ERV activation may provide a mechanistic link between cancer and stimulation of the immune system by microbiota or pathogenic infections. 
So there's there are links uh, between cancer and infections. Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah, whoever's out there. Well, HPV. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you talking about direct? No, but they 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 say microbiota links between cancer and stimulation of the immune system. I guess that's a hypothesis. It's, no, it yeah. says may provide a mechanistic link between cancer and stimulation of the immune system by microbiota or pathogenic infections. Yeah. So in other words, I mean, that's what I'm asking. Do we know of cases where uh, microbial, aside, aside from HPV and viral-induced cancers, I guess Helicobacter pylori, right? Yeah. Um, and there, there may be others that, uh, I was just trying to think of others that fit that one. Well, there's there's a theory in oncology that that maybe a lot more cancers than we suspect are are caused by infectious agents or um, mm-hmm. or imbalances of this sort. But um, I, and I think that may be what they're referring to here. Yeah, and I think yeah. I think those would be probably the ones that we could think of offhand are ones where there's a more direct explanation, like we actually know right. the virus carries an oncogene or something. Right, right. right. And, where it's, and where it's a, uh, more or less a single cause, as far as we can tell. Do we know how helicobacter causes stomach cancer? I don't personally know. <laughs> no, no, I don't either. I don't either, but it could be that it's some mechanism like this, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, and others as well. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I see where you like the nature paper a little better. It seems to be more extensive, too, in uh, what they looked at. I like them both, and I, I got to say that there's a lot of power comes out of the fact that they that both these two independent groups did this and that they did yes. it in different ways. That's That's the really important thing here. I think either paper alone, you might think, well, I don't know. But when you see... Two different groups taking slightly different approaches, converging on the same phenomenon. It, it, it means there's something there that's worth going after. Yeah, apparently there had been other works suggesting the role of TLRs and antibodies in regulating exogenous uh, yeah. infection, right, with these viruses. So they that, they yeah. said, well, what about the ones that are in you? And then, so the again to come back to the human story. Welkin, it could be that we have periodic activations, but they're held in check by our immune system. But you would think now and then they would break through in, in some people who are defective in immune responses, right? We don't see that really. Yeah, I mean, there are cases of, of retro tra- transposition of line elements and things causing insertional activation of genes. Right. <clears throat> that and maybe maybe those things are triggered by processes like this yes but as far as complete infectious retroviruses go we don't know of we're not aware of cases where people generate them and then become ill as a consequence right oh no no. i think the only i want to be careful i think that the only human retrovirus we know of that that causes leukemia is htlv right cell leukemia virus and that's actually in a genus of Retroviruses for which no one has ever seen an endogenous sequence doesn't mean they don't exist, but no one's come across them yet. That's um, the, so, lent- the lentes, right? No, it's uh, it's uh, Delta retrovirus. That's right. The lentes do f- make endogenous sequences, right? Yeah. But although HIV has not been found in humans, right? Endogenously. No, no. HTLV, Robert Gallo thought it was going to be that HIV was another HTLV when it first was discovered. But right, right. They're two very different kind of viruses. So the Delta retroviruses do not... Uh, this is why everybody got so excited about XMRV, right? For a while there, everyone thought, here's a gamma retrovirus yeah. infecting humans. Right. right. Um, so the, the, the uh, Delta retroviruses do not endogenize. Well, they might, but no one's, no one's found it. Yeah. yeah. And you can't uh, get it to happen in an animal model at all. Are there animal delta retroviruses besides the human ones? Yeah, there's simian ones. So it's similar to the HIV, SIV, that they're probably come to humans by way of other primates. Are there murine delta retroviruses? Um, 
Not like HTLV1, no. Mm. Because then you could try endogen. I mean, that would be a species that you could readily check for endogenization, right? Yeah. I mean, if you want to make it, I suppose you could put a transgenic created on purpose by transgenesis. Yeah, that would be so. That would be artificial. You want to know if infection could do it, right? Yeah, because that is something we don't understand, right? How you endogenized in the be- to, in the first place with a retrovirus has it get into the germline, right? We don't know what cells infected. No, I the the experimental, um, the one sort of experimental evidence I know about. Uh, I, what's his name? Is it Rudy Yanish? Mm-hmm. Um, when some when they were using. A, quite a while ago now, MLVs to try and generate um, sort of random insertional mutagens. The way it happened is the virus would infect, I think, I want to say it was like a very early stage embryo or zygote or something. So Mm -hmm. it would infect cells that eventually would differentiate and some of them would be germline cells. So the proviruses would be part of the germline. So probably, I imagine the easiest way for it to happen is if, if you have... Uh, viremia during pregnancy, I guess. Right. Get infection of those cells that then differentiate into germline. Yeah, that's interesting because um, I don't know if you remember Carolyn Coyne's placental resistance story. Yeah, from ASV? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone asked her about retroviruses because they those cells seem to be resistant to many viruses that she checked, but Retroviruses might be able to get in there, right, to do this, to do exactly this endogenization. Yep. I think she said she was checking it. Has that come out yet? No, it hasn't. Um, Watch it. That was one of my favorite talks at the meeting. She said in her email, I think, recently to us that it had been submitted, so maybe soon. Yeah, that'd be cool. We'll do that paper when it comes out. Yeah. All right. This is a good story. I like this. Yeah. Made it a little clearer for me. I have a question <clears throat> before we move on. Yeah. But yeah. I'm, I'm curious what, what if the, you came across any explanation for what TLR7 would be recognizing in the case of a retrovirus. Oh, that's a good point. We actually haven't talked about that. Like, what, from what I read in the papers, TLR7 senses things like double stranded RNA, right. unusual RNA, but retroviral genomes look like messenger RNA. So I'm wondering in what way they would be different that TLR7 would recognize them. I'm sure somebody knows. I just I don't know offhand. Well, <clears throat> TLR7 recognizes single-stranded RNA, right? Let's look here. TLR7, single-stranded RNA, yes. So it could recognize retroviral mRNA. So how do they, how do they distinguish... <laughs> <laughs> Technology 101, since I don't know it. How, do, how does it distinguish self-RNA from viral RNA? Is it the route by which it gets into this? Yeah, I believe it's endosomal. TLR7 is endosomal. So normally, you know, self-stuff isn't in there. I think that that's one idea. TLR3, same thing, double-stranded RNA, but it's endosomal. So 7 and 9 are both uh, endosomal as well. Of course, it depends on the cell as well. But maybe in the sensing cells, like the dendritic cells, it's just going to pick up endocytosed material largely. Would that make sense for your retrovirus then? Yeah, yeah. Do I think that's what's happening? I wonder in general if anything has ever, if there are going to be sensors out there yet to be discovered that recognize like RT intermediates or something like that. Sure, Probably. I, yeah, there are a lot of proteins in the genome whose functions are not known, right? Yeah. I mean, the DNA sensors are only still being revealed, right? So um, I, I'm sure. Always going to be something to discover. <laughs> it's going to be right in front of your face, and you could still not know it. And <laughs> and somebody else will discover it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I thought of that, but I didn't do it. Anything else we should hit on, Welkin, here? We cover it all? Or enough to for people to understand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know you don't cover it all, but <laughs> you know, immunology. I always struggle with it because the immunologists love acronyms and abbreviations even more than virologists. And <laughs> yeah, these papers are tough to get through. We didn't yeah. really go through the data because it would take us two weeks. It was. It's really full of acronyms. 
It's hard. I Even know. commentaries that are supposed to help you were full of acronyms. Yeah. I had yeah, trouble. Because the, the system itself is full of molecules, and you've got to call them something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we make acronyms for viruses too, right? Yeah. So whatever you're used to. So maybe the immunologists complain when we, you know, call our viruses different things or various genes. Um, let's do a couple of emails here. Uh, Alan, could you take uh, that first one from Eric? Uh, yeah, let me just scroll down here. Eric uh, writes, Dear Vincent, as I do for all TWIV, I gen- greatly enjoyed the discussion of the RACPI-V polyomavirus that Pat Pesavento from UC Davis discovered in raccoon brain cancers. I hope Pat will be able to discuss her work on TWIV. The discussion with Stuart Firestein about ignorance in science also reminded me of the quote I used as intro to my thesis. Education is the progressive discovery of our ignorance by historian Will Durant. I thought you might also enjoy the virus-like toys uh, below. It sends a link. Um, kind of like the plant seeds pick for TWIV 215. Like real viruses, they can spring open into different shapes and clamp shut into, t- into tight spheres. It's kind of cool. Yeah, these are very cool. Kids oh, this actually. Oh, yeah. I think my daughter these. was my daughter was talking about these. Bakugan, yeah. Bakugan, yeah. Yeah, they're very cool. My son has these things. You can <laughs> on like the fridge, and they pop open. Yeah, they have magnets in them, and when they hit a metal area, they pop open. In fact, I'm going to show a picture of them to my virology class to sort of illustrate spring loaded the spring loaded concept of virions. You know, with the right trigger, they pop open. Oh, I may have to get a. I mean, I may have to get my daughter a few of these. <laughs> They're very cool. There's beautiful spheres, and then they pop open into different characters, you know? Cool. Uh, okay, Eric continues. Still trying to get my kids to understand that viruses are neither dead nor alive, but like zombies need to feed on living <laughs> tissues. They get great amusement from loudly announcing that their daddy studies viruses in poo and pointing out interesting samples on the streets. Nice. Yeah. Uh, when they get older, they'll stop doing that. Don't yes. worry. <laughs> Yeah, these are very cool. These are going to be the episode image, I think. Cool. They're li- yeah. Five years ago, some friends brought these back to my son from uh, Japan, and um, they're just cool. You roll them over a. There's actually a little game board that comes with them, and you roll them on the game board, and when they hit a piece of metal, they pop open, and it's part of the game. But it's cool. You ever hear cool. of these, Welkin? Bakugan? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my daughter had them for a while. There was a phase. Yeah. Well, they had them laying around the house. Uh, Welkin, do you like reading email? Yeah. Go ahead. Take Lindsay's. Um, So, Lindsay writes, Dear Vincent and colleagues, I have three things I wanted to talk about. First, I've only recently discovered your collection of twee podcasts, and I'm slowly but surely working my way through them. I just listened to the special TWIV with Stuart Firestein and was reminded of the importance of mentors. An advanced degree in microbiology is my ultimate goal since I was in high school, and I would really like to find a mentor, but I'm not quite sure how to go about finding one. I apologize if this has been asked and answered already. Um, Should I go on, or do we want to answer that? Uh, You could go on, sure. Second, I wanted to thank you for what is surely more than a hobby. I imagine that a lot of work, patience, and dedication goes into producing three amazing podcasts week after week. I'm currently employed as what amounts to as a valve-turning, button-pushing monkey. <laughs> this is, and this is one of the podcasts that keeps my mind engaged day after day. So you're doing a real public service, Vincent. <laughs> Uh, third, if you haven't found this already, I wanted to share a new Twitter hashtag a friend shared with me. Overly Honest Methods has collected several gems, and she provides a link to this. It, it's actually hysterical. I don't know if either of you have read it yet. Yeah, we had it last week as a couple of picks, I think, or, or a week yeah, before. Yeah, we talked about it uh, a week or so ago, and, and I, I also participated in this hashtag on Twitter. Yeah, Alan donated one, right? Yeah, I, I donated a couple of them, but the one that seemed to get the most traction was um, uh, overnight incubations ran for 16 to 20 hours, depending on how many pubs I hit that night. <laughs> you should have put on your uh, thing that you stuck in the middle of your method section in your thesis. You remember that? You probably forgot already. Oh, what did I do? So in the middle of Alan's method section, it said, 
you know, all these methods. And all of a sudden, run-on sentences were constructed with Microsoft yes. Word. Yes. And only Jim Hogle picked it up, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably no one else read it, right? No one else read the methods. The methods, exactly. It was good. All <laughs> right, so how do you pick a mentor? So... She says that an advanced degree in microbiology is her ultimate goal. So, I mean, the most direct way to do it would be to go to graduate school. Or is she asking how to pick a mentor once you're there? Well, I don't know. I would like to find a mentor, maybe someone to advise her on this. I don't know what stage. So it sounds like she's working, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if she's gone to college mm -hmm. yet or has already gone to college. Um, so what Rich Condit always says is go find a lab and volunteer to wash dish was, dishes and see if it's a good or, match. Or turn valves and push buttons if they need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like a research lab there. No. Um, you know, go try and volunteer somewhere and see if uh, you like the lab, right? If you don't, find another one. It's kind of hit or miss, but you know, if you start at a good place and... The assumption is that they're good people at good places, right? Yeah, yeah, and part of part of most graduate programs is that you do a series of rotations through labs. And so you'll get a feel for the different lab environments that are there, and then you can pick one from that set. I got, when I was a rotating student, a senior student in the program, when I was trying to pick labs, a more senior student told me that what I should do is imagine myself in the lab, not on my best day, but on my worst day. <laughs> Is that the lab that you're going to be okay yeah, in yeah. You're having a really bad day? Are those the people you'll get along with? And I thought that was pretty good advice. That is. Yeah. But if you, uh, I mean, you do need to apply to graduate schools. So if that's what you're asking, once you're there, you can do these rotations and find one. But if you'd like to find out ahead of time if this is what you want to do, yeah, you should go. Go work in a lab, for sure. That's what I did for a year. It really helped a lot. Uh, Alan, could you take the next one? Sure. Marion writes, regarding the finding that adenovirus capsids bind coagulation factor X, Dr. Mark Chrislip of the of Persiflegger's Infectious Disease Podcast, I think it's PUSCast, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is constantly saying that infectious events precipitate cardiac events and has given various mechanisms to explain it. This represents yet another. Also, you mentioned that in the horseshoe crab, coagulation proteins represent a primitive adaptive immune response. Remember that Staphylococcus aureus has coagulase as an important virulence factor. You brought up viruses for gene transfer delivery. Poliovirus-based vectors have also been used for gene transfer. It's coag I have to do this because it happened to me many times on that episode. Coagulation factor 10. Factor 10, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I did it so many times. Yes, and now I picked it up, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know how you would use polio as a vector once it's eradicated, right? You're not, you can't use it anymore. Right. Unless you don't have the capsid there, but then you lose all the good targeting, the mucosal immunity and the targeting. So. And it's very limited as a vector. Yeah. It's I think a there small are genome. There are better vectors, right? Yeah. Uh, Alexandra Wright. Dear Dr. Zaracaniello, De Pommier, Dove, Condit, and Spidler. So you get them all because we complain all the time, right? <laughs> First, I want to thank you for the gift of this netcast and of the sister shows Twip and Twim, of which I am also a fan. I discovered this show midway through my fall semester 2012, and Twiv has been my primary relaxation and motivation. As a biology student, I would motivate, motivate myself to study for chemistry or other coursework by saying, finish this chapter and you can listen to Twiv. In the space of a month, I listened to nearly 40 episodes. That's great. So you look at TWIV as, as fun, right? That's awesome. That's great. Second, I have a few questions, likely naive, but you will forgive me, I hope, as I am only an undergraduate. Of course, and you're not only an undergraduate. You, you are, are an undergraduate. undergraduate. This past fall, I took a course on ecology and biodiversity. And one topic we covered was kingdom fungi. I am curious about viruses of fungi. I've heard a little about plant viruses, tobacco mosaic virus, but I've never heard of a fungal virus. My question is, many phyla of fungi have cenocytic hyphae. That is, the filaments that make up the bulk of the fungus have no cell walls or cell membranes. 
These hyphae are about one cell thick, but can be many hundreds or thousands of cells long. And in sinocytic rather than septate hyphae, there are no barriers between one nucleus and the next. How does this affect the viruses of fungi? Thank you once again. I suspect I will pepper you with questions in the future. And if my questions have sometimes been answered in previous episodes, forgive me. It will probably take me a year to work my way through the entirety of your archive. Wow. It's okay. It doesn't matter if you, if you ask questions that uh, have already been answered because after a few episodes, people forget anyway. I know I do. Yeah. Fungal viruses. Mycoviruses. So what I know about mycoviruses could be held within a mycovirus. Yes. <laughs> I do know that most of them tend to be just RNAs that are passed along with the cells when they divide. They don't have extracellular phases. It's, right, viroids are much more common in plants and fungi, right? Yeah. Um, so I know the, you know, the double-stranded RNA viruses of yeast, right? Um, they don't have extracellular phases. I don't know if that's true um, for all fungal viruses. I just don't know. Oh, there are particles of some of them, apparently. We have to get a fungal virus person on here. We should get a mycovirologist on. That would be cool. Um, do you know anything about fungal viruses, Alan? Nothing. How about you, Welkin? Very, very little. I know that... You, hey, well, can you got to unplug your USB and put it back in again? Please. You have uh, gone to the yeah. distorted side. Can you hear me now? Ah, beautiful. Much better. <laughs> what were you what saying about fungal viruses? Well, I think the, the question she asked applies to plant viruses oh, in a lot right? of cases, too. These, when, the, well, yeah. the, well, they have channels of, of cells that, that the virus can pass from one to the other. So I was thinking, did you, you've had Marilyn Rusink on the show, haven't you? Yeah, we did at ASV once, yeah. I think she might be a good person to ask about this. Yeah, Jack uh, Morris at Nebraska, we should also get back. He, he's a plant virologist as well. And fungal virologist. So we don't have an answer for you, Alexandra. But we'll but, get someone who can. Yeah, we should definitely <clears throat> definitely do an episode about that sort of thing. All right. You know those fungal viruses, they, I think you mentioned that they'll have capsids, and that's an interesting point, too, because it tells you that the capsid is more than just an extracellular shell, right? So even viruses that don't get out, like the yeast viruses, even viruses that don't get out, the capsid serves function, right? Yeah, it's, it's there in the cell, but it doesn't, you're right, it's not for transmission only. That's right, it's a good point. It's probably mm. part of the replication architecture or something. It may have been for transmission at some point in evolutionary history, yeah. though. Yeah. And now it's, it's just retaining its previous functions. Mm hmm. All right, let's. Um, how many did we do? We did a couple, right? Let's do some picks now. How's that? Sure. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. Yep. We're, we're around, getting close to the 90 minute mark. All right. Um, Alan, what do you have for us today? Uh, I have uh, some cool pictures. Um, these are, they're just juxtapositions of images of, um, on one side, a, a satellite photo of a city, and adjacent to it, there's a micrograph of a neuron. Ah. <laughs> and this, this person, it's a website of a graphic designer who, I guess, just combed through image files. Hmm. And, of course, neurons take all sorts of shapes where you but but they all have this general theme of a, a bright soma and then the dendrites extending outward. And cities viewed from the air, you have a bright downtown. At night, you have a bright downtown district, and then you have the roads and the highways extending outward. Um, and so um, this is just, you know, ones that happen to have this similarity at the micro and the macro scale, and it's a, it's a cool set of image pairs. Is it cool? Do you recognize any of the cities? <laughs> I was looking for the names I, I, of them. I couldn't. Yeah, I don't. Um, uh, doesn't, he doesn't have names. No, I didn't. Couldn't find them. Nope. Uh, so would you recognize some cities? You think? I don't know. <laughs> I might. Bet you'd recognize Boston, right? Yeah, or Manhattan. Yeah, what? I think I'd recognize New York. I don't By think it's shape, in here. Yeah, that's pretty unique. Those are cool, though. Yeah. 
Welcome. What do you have? Um, so my pick is actually a book, um, and it's it's a self serving pick because I my actual pick is a link to a review that I wrote about the book. Um, the book is called Viruses: Essential Agents of Life. It was a, a book that just came out from Springer, and it's a um, uh, the reason I liked it is it's a compendium of chapters written by a whole bunch of different virologists, and and the nothing in the book is about reductionist principles of virology. It's all very big picture forward looking, right? So So it's all about ignorance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it really makes you realize that the the first hundred years of virology has really been about in the lab and being very reductionist and looking at the molecular details. And if you read any chapter in this book or if you start working your way through it, it starts to dawn on you that that the the numbers involved here are so vast that you can't even picture them, right? When you think about all the virions that must exist in the world on any given day, I, there's one chapter where they calculated it's like 10 to the 31st or something like that, right? It's, it's kind of mind-blowing, but you start reading this book and after a while you start realizing that the viruses can't possibly be a sideshow in life circus, right? These viruses have to have been major players both in the origins of life and in the ongoing evolution of life. And I really, I like that idea of, among other things, it makes you excited about the idea of being a virologist because there's, now that we have methods for getting viruses from nature, even unculturable viruses, right, you can start to study this kind of thing. So, so even though the book itself is kind of a hodgepodge of different chapters and different topics, reading it can be very um, uh, exciting, especially if you're somebody starting out in virology now. Looks like I can download the whole thing here. Yeah, I, I got an electronic version. Yeah, I mean, here we have Springer's Relief, so maybe it's through our academic... Uh, I don't yeah. know. You should try it, uh, Alan. Try. Because the... Wait, where's the... All the way at the bottom of the review. You download the entire, yeah, uh, here. <clears throat> There's a great quote. You've had Louis uh, Villarreal on your show. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Long, long time ago, yeah. And, and one of the best quotes in the book, he says, uh, indeed, it's the product of viruses that are the most prevalent genes in nature. The implications of the massive omnipresence. Can <laughs> it, the massive omnipresence, he's talking about viruses. No, I get, I get hit with a paywall. I've got to purchase it for 20 pounds or $30. Really? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Can I download it? I just uh, tried chapter one. Let's see if it worked. Viruses. I can download the front matter. <laughs> yeah, I got chapter one. No, I can't get to chapter one. Um, and let's see if I can get chapter two. Oh, boy. This is great. <laughs> A benefit of being... Oh, I shouldn't say that. I have lots of benefits. Yeah, I can download the whole thing. Cool. This is great. It looks like a great book. And I, had, I think I had seen your review... I think Steve Goff sent me your review over at Small Things Considered, uh, Welkin, and I went somewhere to buy it, and it was really expensive. Yeah, I bought an electronic version, but yeah, I, I, th I think that's too bad. That's the nature of the sort of the niche publishing. Yeah. Sometimes there's a book like this that should be widely read, and um, um, I guess it's just it would be difficult for them to publish it if they given the limited audience. No, you can't give it away. They have chapters by Marilyn Rusink. Yeah. Luis, and as you said. There's four chapters on Mimi viruses, actually. Oh, but on viruses, bats, and men. Uh, a lot of these names I don't know, which means nothing. <laughs> cool. It looks great. That's a nice one. Yeah. So that is a recent post of yours over at uh, Alio's blog. Yeah, they they asked me to. So Mary Ewell and Forrest Rower wrote one of the chapters, right? And, and I initially was going to review that chapter, and um, Mary actually thought it would be nicer if I did the whole book, <laughs> which means I couldn't do it in a day. I had to take a month and read the whole book. But <laughs> <laughs> well, good. It's good. Like it. All right, my pick is a cool post I found over at Make. Uh, make zine, I guess. Yeah. You know, make double colon. Everybody knows that. We've talked about it before. This guy, he built a spaceship for his son from scrap broadcast equipment. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so, underneath the kid's um, bunk, bed, bunk bed, I guess, bed. or lofted bit. Yeah. Oh, is that what that is? Okay. 
Yeah, so the kid is clearly totally thrilled by this thing. He's <laughs> five years old. And this guy did such a great job. It's just full of pictures. And it looks great. <laughs> I wanted it's, this when I was a young kid. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so many cool. buttons and knobs and sliders, dials even. It's yeah. gorgeous. Wow. So really nice. It's really This guy spent time on this. He had to get everything. So check that out. That's really cool. Uh, we we have, just yeah. take a cardboard box and draw things. <laughs> yeah, <that>. right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a couple of listener picks. Uh, the first one is from, who was it? Lindsay. No, Lindsay, not, not Lindsay. Did we not read it, maybe? Oh, it was way back in the follow-up. It was back right. at the beginning in the follow-up, right. That was Amanda. All right, Amanda said, I want to submit a listener pick. My friend Patricia knows how hard it can be for me to switch from experiment mode to writing mode, so she turned me on to this website called Written Kitten. Basically, every X number of words you write, customizable, it will show you a delightful kitten picture. <laughs> so if you like kittens, a lot of people do. That's cute. Um, we have another one. Seems like you could rework that same idea in many different ways, depending on someone's yeah. tastes. <laughs> should make one give you a new virus every hundred words or whatever. Uh so that was Amanda. We have one from Kevin. This was presented as part of a lecture in my molecular biology course. It's awesome. And this is protein synthesis, an epic on the cellular level. And this is the movie made in 1971 uh, yes. at Stanford, which is a classic. And I think Rich probably picked it once. So yep. this is really cool to re relink to it. And then we have one from Daria, dear Twiv virologist. Here's my pick of the week, and it is uh, the Baltimore scheme, yep, which is very cool, and which I just taught last week. So there you go, over at uh, Wikipedia, and that's our Twiv picks of the week. All right, that'll do it. Twiv TV is where you can find this. Also, iTunes, and if you uh, like us, go over to iTunes, subscribe, and. Just leave a rating or a comment. That really helps us a lot. We have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology. And send your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Welkin Johnson is in the biology department over at Boston College. Thanks for joining us, Welkin. Happy to be here. Should get you back more often. Absolutely. Too long. You want to do that more often than every year? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's great. I just I shut my door and nobody comes in here and bugs me. <laughs> and, I get to, <laughs> and I get to talk. <laughs> and you should tell your class that uh, you do this, you know. And tell them to, oh, you do. You tell them to yeah. listen to it. That's I, I have to tell you, when I get the evals back on my course, yeah, right. all the work I put in the course and all they evaluate it on is how much they like having the podcasts <laughs> to <Good>. listen to. <laughs> Glad they like it. That's really good. Well, we so like I'm just going to stop giving lectures. I'll just have them listen. <laughs> sign podcasts. Oh, we could do a course for you. You know, yeah, you could just come here and do the course and sign them all to them. Anyway, that's great. Thanks for joining us. Alan Dove is at alandove.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Of course, we missed our co-hosts, Rich and Kathy, today. Yes, though. we did. I think they'll be back next week. Well, next week, Rich and I will be talking to Tony Fauci. Right, and then uh, the week after we'll we'll all be back together, or maybe not. I don't know, but anyway, we miss them. <laughs> there you go, morbid again. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's the morbid episode. Yes, <clears throat> maybe that should be the title. The morbid. <laughs> I liked actually. Um, this is one comment someone made. Oh yes, a, a monkey pushing knobs and turning buttons. Well, yes, pushing buttons and turning. I like that for a title, but we'll talk about that in the after dark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>